Hi, hello, I'm Anna Bichillian. And I'm Ryder Chamberlain. And today we are interviewing Maria Caulfield for the BBC School Report. Maria is an MP and the Vice Chair for Women of the Consecutive Party. Here we have some questions for Maria we would like to ask. Question one, why do you support Brexit? Well, Brexit is a difficult issue. I think everyone, uh, you know, it's a very close vote and uh, people have got strong feelings on either side. I was actually, uh, I could have been convinced to vote Remain. Um, David Cameron, before the referendum, went to see uh, the EU uh, in Brussels to uh, try and uh, negotiate a good deal for the country and he didn't really um, come away with an awful lot. And so at that point I decided to, to vote for Brexit because I believe that we've got a good opportunity in a number of areas, so we can strike um, good trade deals with countries outside of the EU, which we currently can't while we're members of the EU. Uh, we also, when you are um, making laws in Westminster, um, at the moment we're very constrained with uh, some of the laws that are made in the EU. We don't really have the ability to either change those laws or to do what's called repeal them, which means scrap them completely. Um, so we haven't really got the power in Westminster uh, in terms of representing people who send us to Parliament uh, that we, we really think uh, we should have that could make a difference. Um, but also things like immigration. At the moment, we've got free movement of people uh, from the EU, and we're, t we're having to turn away people from outside the EU. And as a nurse, we were turning away nurses from the Philippines, doctors from Canada or Australia, and we'd quite like to see a much more global uh, immigration uh, system. The EU has had benefits for this country, um, and if we were able to have made some changes, I've got a big fishing community, for example, in New Haven, uh, and with the current fishing quota system that the EU runs, uh, the fishermen in New Haven are really, really struggling. The same is, is true of fishermen in Hastings down the coast. So there's some things that you know we would like to take uh, control of, um, that I think would make a big difference to the country. But it's a divisive issue, and I recognise the, the, the strong feelings on either side. You were re-elected as a Member of Parliament in, Le in Lewis on June 8th last year with over two, two, 25,000 votes. What did you tell people or do to get people to vote for you? OK. Um, I mean, elections are a difficult time, and particularly um, that election because it was called a, uh, what's called a snap election. So there was very little notice that that was happening. More, uh, more traditionally nowadays, we have um, set elections, uh, and you know we knew the one before in 2015. We knew for a good few years before that was going to happen. So you had plenty of time to get round and knock on doors and meet people and tell them what you were going to do for them. Um, in the snap election, we just had a few weeks. So I knocked on as many doors as possible, met as many residents, and I'd been working for the, the, the two years I'd been elected as an MP on local issues. So I was already uh, speaking to people about what mattered to them. And I decided to run a really positive campaign and not make it that political. So it was really about the progress I've made so far on some of the key issues, things like the A27, for example, which we're trying to, to get improved uh, to make it a, a safer and less congested road. Um, things around planning, um, you know, because we want to make sure that we protect our green countryside but still build houses on what's called brownfield sites. Um, issues around uh, the railway service, so Southern Rail was a huge issue. Um, I'm sure most of you have uh, experienced the, the, the pleasures of Southern Rail um, and I worked really hard on that to try and get a better service for residents. So I told people uh, what I'd done and how I was going to continue to work for them over the next uh, few years if they re-elected me. Um, and I didn't really get involved in the party politics of, you know, don't vote for this person because I'm better than them. I didn't really go down that route um, because I think, I think one of the lessons from the referendum is that people actually want to have a, a genuine debate about things. And, um, you know, doing the usual political stuff doesn't always go down well. So that, that was my, my way of campaigning. If you were the vice chair for um, the women of the Conservative Party, why do you think pregnant women who want to have an abortion should be lowered? Uh, to time. Okay, so abortion is uh, uh, an issue that uh, has been highlighted uh, in terms of my uh, views. So abortion is such a sensitive issue because it's such a personal decision. Um, so any woman who's going to uh, think about having an abortion, you know, doesn't do that lightly. And, and you know, there's, it's an often an emotional time for many women. Um, so there isn't a party political stance on abortion. So you won't find the Labour Party say one thing, the Conservative Party say another. It's what's called a conscience vote. So MPs are uh, vote how they individually feel uh, is uh, applicable. And uh, they, there's no party kind of whipping system in terms of, of what position you take. My personal decision uh, or view on abortion has been 
very much misrepresented in, in the media. So I don't have a problem with any woman who wants to have an abortion. I certainly wouldn't um, judge them or stop them from doing that or want a change in the law to stop them from doing that. But I did speak out on what's called the decriminalisation of abortion because the current law actually protects really vulnerable women. So women who may be forced to have an abortion or have a partner who's uh, pushing them to have an abortion, the current law really protects them. They have to go and see two GPs before they can, or two doctors before they can uh, go ahead. And often that uh, space with an independent healthcare professional sometimes then opens up other support mechanisms um, for them. So to remove that and to say that you don't need to go down that route um, would actually, I think, put vulnerable women in a very difficult situation with no access to uh, independent support and advice. Um, so I don't want to change restrict abortion for women. I currently, I have many, many people come and see me in my, sur in my surgeries. I've got a big surgery this afternoon uh, with people coming to see me about their problems. I've never had any woman come and see me and say that she couldn't access abortion. So the current law allows free access for abortion, but it protects vulnerable women, and that's why I voted against changing uh, the, the rules on abortion. Um, that doesn't mean I'm anti-abortion as such. It just means I think we need to make sure when we change the law, that we don't, um, you know, change the safeguards we have in place that, that are working quite well. Um, are you spending enough? Uh, are you spending money on skate parks and other equipment for communities and small villages? Yes, so a good example of that, we are. Um, I mean, money is tight at the moment for local councils because the country um, as a whole, we're just getting on top of this now, but uh, for, for the last few years, um, a bit like your pocket money um, that, you, that you, hopefully you get from, from your parents, that you, if you've got a set amount of money, if you spend more uh, than your pocket money is uh, uh, allocated, you're going to have to pay some of that back to your parents. And the country's in the same situation. For a number of years, we've been spending more than we actually generate from the tax of hard-working people in this country. And so we run what's called a deficit. And you have to pay interest on that deficit. And our interest payments each year are £56 billion. That's more than the police budget and the armed forces budget put together. So we are desperately trying to get on top of that because we'd rather spend that interest money on schools, on hospitals, on lots of other things. We're starting to get there, but it's meant we've had to make tough decisions. So things we would like to have spent the money on, we couldn't because we want to pay back that debt that we've uh, generated over the last few years. And things like skate parks and community equipment are often the things that go when you have to make tough decisions. But we are starting to see that money coming through. There's a new skate park being built in New Haven, for example, which will uh, replace the one that's in Lewis uh, uh, currently. Um, and there are other grants and there are other ways of getting that community equipment. So one of the things, when I get contacts from big companies like Vodafone, like Sainsbury's, for example, they will often sponsor equipment for villages and I put them in touch with the local parish councils and say if you're planning a big uh, uh, facility for local people here's some money that doesn't come from government but will help you get your uh, skate park or playground or whatever it is built and a good example of that is in East Dean over the other end of the constituency they've been working with some companies to get funding to get a, a play play area in place so there are other ways than just government money to get uh, things set up but, you know, money has been tight for the last few years. It should improve soon. Um, but, you know, these, these community facilities are very important. What are your current political plans for the future? In terms of my personal plans? Or yeah, what do you plan to do? So one of the, I, I'm working on a number of campaigns at the moment, um, on, on, predominantly on local issues. So there's two campaigns that I'm working on at the moment. One is to get defibrillators being put into schools and to other public areas. Uh, most schools have a defibrillator. I don't know if Chaley has one. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe. Don't know. Okay, so defibrillators for those um, for those of you that if you're not quite sure what they do. So if someone has a heart attack. Uh, a defibrillator is a piece of equipment that will get the heart starting again, so it saves lives. But not every school in the country has one, um, and we know that they can save young people's lives, but also people in the surrounding area. So in the, the, the village here, if someone was unwell, you could go to the local school and get, get the defibrillator. So um, I, the reason I'm working on that campaign is there was a young lady who was the young mayor of Seaford last year called Jessica Batchelor, and that was her campaign, and she wanted to know why in Parliament we haven't made it law that every school must have a defibrillator. So I took on that campaign and we're, it's a long process but we're hoping to make some progress on that. 
And the other area is around mobile phone signals in prisons, because currently we've got Lewis Prison in the constituency. Currently, mobile phones are being used by prisoners, even though that's illegal, to get drugs into the prison, to commit crime outside of the prison, to kind of bully um, other inmates or to bully people on the outside of the prison. And what we're trying to do is bring in a law that will block the phone signal. So even if they get the phone into the prison, it won't work. And that will make our prisons safer, it will make the jobs for prison officers easier, but it will make our communities outside safer too. So they're two of my campaigns that I'm working on. That's all our questions for today. Thank you very much for coming in, Maria Caulfield. Thanks all from BBC Report today. Thank you. Thank you, Ida, and thank you, Adam.